assalamu alaikum i welcome you all on behalf of my team hope so you all are well and good our first topic is about political conflict in pakistan and we have our guest mohammed wasim from lums university and mohammed raza rumi from nayador we invite you on uh, the stage please come on the stage sir uh, good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen my uh, privilege and pleasure uh, to be here and i'm grateful uh, to think fest to have invited me and, and in particular uh, to have this conversation with dr mohammed wasim who needs no introduction he is pakistan's uh, foremost political scientist a scholar of great merit uh, in fact uh, you know he's inspired generations of people in, including myself uh, i grew up reading his works his books his articles and we are going to be talking about his new book that came out in 2022 Uh, which is entitled uh, political conflict in pakistan but let me also introduce a bit more uh, our our uh, guest here uh, dr wasim was the uh, chair of the ir department at the qaid azam university for a very long time i've forgotten the years are so long and then he uh, also uh, was at st anthony's college at, at oxford uh, in paris in heidelberg in the in the us and then he uh, came to lahore uh, to lums uh, lahore university of management sciences and uh, he has obviously contributed uh, in terms of understanding pakistan and its various political uh, problems and dynamics so welcome dr saab and uh, i think we will get straight into uh, your book uh, this book is a magisterial a panoramic uh, overview Uh, in-depth overview of Pakistan's political uh, conflict as well as its history. It's a very interesting and uniquely uh, written book uh, because it's not just a theoretical compendium that we often find uh, uh, by other authors, but it also delves deeply into the historical factors that shaped. Uh, pakistan's identity its uh, nation building its institutions formation and how these different ideas ideologies institutions have uh, over time contributed to a perennial state of conflict even aaj bhi jo hum dekh rahe hain ye jo polarization hai conflict hai between uh, at the political level between the state and the political actors wo all of that uh, can be understood through that so dr saab my first question to you is please elaborate what are the contributing factors to this uh, uh, ongoing and perennial political conflict in in particular uh, the institutions and the ideas that have shaped to this conflict very hi thank you after this brilliant introduction i feel like speaking because i wouldn't be able to go past that to the merit which you attached to me but uh, ladies and gentlemen this book is about political conflict in pakistan uh, why conflict because you you use the word is crisis you use the word is mal governance you really you talk about the problems of india pakistan other countries and these countries are in a permanent crisis of governance and there is so much has we should be talking talk about but political conflict in pakistan that's the focus why is it that conflict is almost permanent in pakistan but then when i try to explore the dynamics of conflict i was alerted to the fact that in india bangladesh forty countries of africa 30 countries of latin america conflict conflict and conflict persists why why is it in england france germany italy america where we go uh, some of us and they will find if you buy the ticket and travel by the train and it's all a peaceful activity and of course you vote or you don't vote for any particular election at any level local bodies or senate or whatever there is no problem instability what is it of course people crumble all the time the poor people in these countries they say okay republican comes the democrat we remain the same they are extremely cynical because they are a part and parcel of the power struggle of top so here what is it 
So I try to look at political conflict in Pakistan in a framed way. What is the frame? Why here? Then I saw in other such countries. Why? Then there were these countries, there is the West, where they have a conflict resolution mechanism of some sort which works. And of course, in very underdeveloped countries, traditional societies, Gulf states, for example, Bahrain, Kuwait, others, they have some kind of a conflict resolution mechanism. So you don't see that kind of instability which you see in our part of the world. So what is it? Then I started looking at countries which belong to the category where we belong to. Post-colonial states. We are a post-colonial state. And there, there was the rule of a modern imperialist power which transplanted institutions and laws from Europe to this land, into this land, and into 20, 30, 40, 50 lands of Asia and Africa and other countries, other uh, continents. So here, what do we see? That, that transplantation was incomplete. Colonial state was a limited instrumentality. It didn't go deep into that uh, structure, which is called society in some senses, but in other senses it did. So what is the post-colonial state? Modern state, traditional society, customary law, these days here, Islamic laws in India, Hinduization of uh, philosophy and law and whatever is happening. Tradition is trying to encroach upon modernity. So, for 100 years under colonialism, there was the modernity taking up, encroaching upon tradition. Then Gandhi and others, the leaders in so many countries of the third world, particularly post colonial space, they then mobilized the societies in terms of their traditions, religions, histories, civilizational dynamics, and then the British or French and others. They withdrew the newly mobilized leaders and public, they took charge of the state. Now there is a conflict. The millions who are here in Pakistan, they follow their customary law, increasing Islamic law, increasingly some kind of a deviation from what was the written state in English constitution is remote from their mind, from their heart, and they can choose their life accordingly. So that was a tussle between the moderns and the traditions. Three generation conflict. Then this colonial state was a collection of three state apparatuses, army, bureaucracy, and judiciary. They then, those who took charge of these institutions before independence, continued, continued to take charge and continue to keep charge of these uh, institutions even after. But the mobilized public started putting demands on the state, which state could not. Uh, uh, deliver on. So what's happening? Here is again the remote English-based state and the vernacular speaking people out there who are demanding all the time. The redistributive mechanism is such that the elite captures all the plums and there is little which has to be redistributed to the masses. The conflict continues. So I therefore talk about the roots of this conflict in a particular model of the state. It doesn't have a conflict resolution mechanism. Like for example in England, there is parliament. Why was parliament invented in a way? Because people out on the streets, they were, con they were in conflict all the time. Then they disengaged the masses from the street and their representatives were supposed to sit in the parliament 
and their public representatives talk to each other to resolve conflicts. Nothing of the kind. Parliament is the weakest institution, uh, far less uh, powerful than the, the three state apparatuses that I've talked about. This is the way I try to solve where the conflict is coming from. Uh, that is the, uh, the distance from the design, I've labeled it, institutional design of the state and pragmatic practice. There is a huge difference between the two, and that's where Ji. conflict becomes very, very uh, endemic. Yeah, that, that's right, the post-colonial state, and I'm glad you elaborated that. But uh, Dr. Vaseem, the state has also gone uh, under uh, transformation in the last 75 years. How far do you think it has? And also the fact that, you know, the masses that you talk about, the traditional society, they also become part of the state through civil service, judiciary, through the police and other uh, mechanisms. So has that impacted, has that changed that nature of the traditional society versus the English speaking or English state that you mentioned? The state has a catchment area from where it, redu it recruits officers for the army and the civilian bureaucracy and the judiciary. That catchment area, that part of the society is the middle class. So there is a near monopoly of the middle class over higher education, 90%. In my university and in other universities, who are the people, the students? Are they from the working classes mainly? Hardly. One or two here and there, or the top, for example, the landed elite, they're not interested because they've got uh, whatever income they can, which is unearned. So it is the middle class which has to exert to, in a way, uh, win some kind of, a, of, a, of, a, of an income. Here is the middle class, a dynamic section of the middle class. The landed and tribal elite, they were there when the British came and they were there when the British left. In 100 years, their role was translated into a legislative role. They were the ones who provided leadership, got elected into the assemblies, in the provincial and national assemblies, and therefore they were the ones who were in a way, in scholarly terms, called collaborators. So they were considered collaborators, turned into legislators for 100 years as the constitutional openings came up. On the other hand, the middle class is the very product of colonialism. English language, primary schools, high schools, universities, the institutions which were developed by the British and in other colonial societies by the colonial powers. And they were, in a way, the target group of the imperial power who shaped them, made them, uh, developed them in their own image. And these were the ones who later became those who manage the state. They are the state managers who makes policy in Pakistan and India and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. The middle class, which then provided officers of the civilian bureaucracy, judiciary, and increasingly in Pakistan's case, the army, because army used to uh, be recruited, let's say, from the rural sector, but after independence, this has been the pattern, and more and more uh, town boys are now in the army. So, what is it? The middle class from day one, from 47 onwards, they feel that they are the conscience of the people, they feel that they own the state because there is a kind of hatred or some kind of adversarial uh, framework of thought vis-a-vis -vis those who get elected. So they wonder why people are mad, people are obviously illiterate, stupid, they are superstitious, whatever, because they vote for these people who are dynastic, etc. So for 75 years of the history of Pakistan, the media and the education. 
these two sources carried out a message of anti-politician, anti-political class, and actually anti-democracy. Democracy doesn't suit us. Democracy is before its time. People should be educated. That's why democracy uh, is not getting uh, successful here. Before we become like the British and others, we should not introduce democracy and so on. So there is a permanent uh, conflict between meritocracy and democracy. Meritocracy, it should be capable people who should run the state, obviously. Common sense is that. And therefore, the, the, the capable people should be elected by the people. But here what happens, the Bengalis look at them, and the Sindhis and the others, they elect the most corrupt people. So there then comes the second aspect of it. First of all, democracy came too early to these countries. People are not uh, capable of uh, electing good uh, masters uh, who would run the country. And thirdly, of course, then there is uh, a gap. The gap is of what? That there is a gap of uh, morality, maybe. They are corrupt. It's a corrupt leadership which is ruling Pakistan. 75 years. Indian people were given the message as the corrupt elite, elected elite, and in Sri Lanka and other countries, wherever corruption. They are the corrupt people. In other words, the balance of power between the two power blocks, which I've called in my book, centers of power, one, the elected ones, the political class, the other, the middle class, they have been competing with each other for power, and they have their own ideological frameworks. The landlords and the tribals who go for elections, they say democracy. We are for democracy. We are people's voice, and they are. And we speak their language. We go to the people's houses, beg for votes, and we then provide patronage to the people. On the other hand, there is the deputy commissioner, there is an officer, others, the bureaucracy, and of course, at a distance, the judiciary, they try to shape, reshape the rules of game, and they are the executive out there, the bureaucracy, and therefore they say we are managing and we have managed successfully this country despite the political elites. So they, this, they despise each other. The Who is for democracy? Who are often condemned to be anti-democratic, which is the electables, those who go into election, and those who are, you know, with conscience keepers of the nation, the educated ones, they blame them for having taken the nation down. This conflict is never ending. Gee, uh, I'm glad you brought in the class uh, angle because that's what I wanted to ask you next that now what is happening in Pakistan you have done in the book that you have done in the analysis that in Pakistan it is completely in the same way because we are seeing that this is a middle class power that is asserting and they are getting a chance to get Imran Khan in the same way in many cities where the community of Imran Khan is the big thing is that the anti-politician sentiment is the same thing that the corrupt politicians corrupt politicians corrupt leadership and they are also the same thing that Khan is also the same thing so tell me that this framework is the same اس کے آج کے بارے میں بھی یہ بتائیے کہ کیا یہ اسی طرح ہنڈر پرسنٹ اس پر اپلائے ہو رہا ہے جو آپ یہ سمجھتے ہیں کہ عمران خان صاحب جو ہے وہ میڈل کلاس کی ان کو مکمل جو ہے سپورٹ ہے اس وقت اور وہ اسرٹ کر رہی ہے اپنی پاور سسٹم کے اندر The system runs like this for example that there is an ideological framework anti-corruption so in India there were movements against corruption. Hazare movement, one of the famous ones in recent history. And there, the anti-corruption movement means the hatred against politicians, particularly in the Indian context, Congress, that led to 
the downfall of those politicians who were in power and ideologically speaking those reformists whom we can call reformists of the right particularly upper caste in india religiously mobilized in on, on the long hindutva line they took over anti corruption movement leads to the politics of the right in india in pakistan this is what happens why because actually if you dig up if you try to analyze what we're talking about oh, corruption 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 okay corruption yes corruption what is there a policy for example uh, how to mitigate the situation how to reduce corruption in fact nothing there's no policy for example we'll bring all the money back from is this corruption the go go to the people for example corruption at the level of patwari kanhu tehsildar district courts where there is quite a bit of discontent about the way local judiciary operates corruption full of corruption people live with it pay get things done pay and that's how hunting to for example he defined corruption in a positive way that it actually lets the system run otherwise it will be blocked so uh, and there are other studies so the best mabul haq if you remember 50 years back he said in this country that is pakistan 32 billion rupees are siphoned off by the bureaucracy bureaucracy in various uh, phases of pakistan's history various groups and institutions have been uh, blamed for corruption but there is a recurrent theme that politicians are the most corrupt so this theme why is it persistent because the media and the education there are two major sources of this particular onslaught on the image of politicians and that is that the media is controlled by whom the people who can read and write the middle class educational textbooks are written by whom the middle class particularly those who are ideologically mobilized in one way or the other these opinion making institutions and people belong to the middle class who talk less of issues more of ideology less of laws here and there more of the overall uh, destiny of the nation so there is a kind of a predestinationism if i can use the word we are all in a way given to an idea of pakistan where issues and policies have gradually disappeared and a an issue like corruption which is hard to define who are you talking about 1 million people who are operating behind a counter 1 million counters of various corporations and offices and whatever we are not talking about that the talk about corruption has taken two forms one that it is focused on a certain class which is one party in the conflict the political elite by the middle class so and it has done successful second the issue of corruption those who are actually operating the system they find it as a system corruption is a system you got it done anything anywhere pay this much and that's it that's it ways open for you but the middle class takes up a moral issue it has created corruption into an ideology that there is this whole class which is despite its democratic credentials anti democratic corrupt they are taking the niche so what do you do five ten people select them and they have kept their um the money abroad they are the ones who are responsible for the poverty of the whole niche so it is the way you create the 
narrative. That is what it matters. It's all in an exercise in narrative. People listen and people get convinced. You formulate a kind of narrative which will sell to the, in a way, unlettered people, so to say, although they are educated by way of uh, colleges and universities, but unfortunately they are, uh, they, they are there are two ways. One is like uh, everywhere in the world, legal socialization. People are raised on laws in England, France, Germany, Italy, everywhere. We are raised, there is here in Pakistan, ideological socialization. Ideology, ideology, ideology and ideology, nationalism, nationalism. In here we talk of national interest in the third world countries. There they talk of public interest. They, the public interest, particularly of those who have selected them or elected them. So that is exactly where the, where the accountability lies. Did they um, serve their constituency? That's why elections are important there. And that's why elections are discounted here in Pakistan, because national, there is an idealized national uh, picture all the time sold to the people, and they start believing in supra-human and uh, surrealistic uh, things, rather than looking at, at the supply of uh, food and uh, education for the children and whatever. So you destroy issues in the name of this particular uh, issue of corruption, which is a mega issue. Thank you. Uh, so we'll uh, open it up soon because I think uh, we we should have more time for the audience and their, their their questions. But last one, I mean, you know, you also introduce a term in your book, uh, establishmentarian democracy. So we hear we hear a lot about you know hybrid democracy, fake democracy, real democracy. So ye bataiye establishmentarian democracy kya hoti hai aur kya Pakistan mein jo sare apni conflict ka bhi zikr kiya, all the dynamics and the imperatives. Is there a way forward that we can overcome this? Is this is there a possibility? What? So, I am joining both of them. Well, 20 years back when I was a bit younger, I would have been more positive. Now, I, I feel that uh, things will remain the same maybe in the near future, unless some of you uh, comes up as the leader. Uh, Establishmentarian democracy, in every country of the world, there is something called establishment. We gradually and we casually talk about American democracy. It's a mature democracy. 20 countries of, the, of Europe, they are mature democracies. Mature democracies, they are well dug in. There is an establishment in and in America, and in Germany, and other countries. They decide, one way or the other, that there should be now a change in the government. Conservatives have spent 12 years, now in the groom, another leader, and a rightist in a Labour Party, whom then we can give power. People must want change and they must have another experience now. If they are disgusted with this party, they must be given another party to rule. But it's not that somebody is conspiring, sitting behind the curtain, no. The establishment is behind the curtain. It's a loose conglomeration of the power wielders sitting at the chest and they play on the chess. Uh, so this, they are chess players. So here in Pakistan, like those establishments in other countries, military-led establishment has now become a household where everybody talks about establishment. Now, what does the establishment want? And have you talked to establishment? <laughs> establishment is known far better today than any other political party. How, how did it become so? Because the first 20 years, Pakistan's establishment was bureaucracy. 
civil bureaucracy, including 10 years of Ayub Khan, when 14 military officers, that is generals, had been co-opted into the state apparatus, but overall it was run under Ayub Khan bureaucratically. That was possible because there was a migrant elite which came from UP and Bombay and Calcutta and of course East Punjab, Raja Muhammad Ali. These were the people who ran the country. That's why I've discussed in my book that Pakistan was a migrant state. Here was Pakistan project conceived and operationalized and pursued by those who did not live in Pakistan areas of today. They came from India. They planned Pakistan. They led the project. They came and they took over. And they distrusted provincial leaderships. So Punjab government goes and frontier government goes and Sindh government collapses and Bengal government goes and of course whatever they could do in one to two years. The first two years they scrapped five governments. These supra-nationalists, these migrant uh, state managers and they continue to detest democracy. These people, particularly from these areas, Pakistan areas, these were marginal to British India. Illiterate, less sophisticated, and in so many other ways. Therefore, they cooked, they came and took over the state. They became gradually the established. Because by way of uh, population, the migrants were no more electable. So most of the sons and daughters of the Muhajir elite went for democracy. Ah, I'm sorry, for bureaucracy. So bureaucrats, they were the, the higher bureaucracy was predominantly migrant. So they, the foreign service of Pakistan alone consisted of 55% Urdu-speaking families. That was a study done in PhD thesis in 1960, 68, 87 or 8. 3% Muhajirs, 55% in foreign, uh, Pakistan Foreign Service alone and in certain other ways also. Today, for example, 7 to 8% population, but they are 21% or so. That means three times more even after whatever has been happening by way of Sindhi nationalism and so on. So, this establishment was, in a way, as it gave place to military in 1970s and 80s, particularly 80s. So, for the last 50 years, it's the military-led establishment. Now, what does it do and why is it? Uh, there in the first place. In India, establishment was even more powerful than in Pakistan. ICS, remember, there was a continuity of ICS in India and there was a discontinuity uh, of ICS here and there. They were, they were posted, but they were not as strong as they were in India. There is a strong establishment in India and, of course, in uh, other countries in other ways. But why? They were subsumed by the political. Nehru brought them in, depended on them, and whatever. But here, since the bureaucrats were themselves the rulers, Governor General, Ghulam Muhammad, bureaucrat, the most powerful man for four years in Pakistan, Secretary General, George Muhammad Ali, bureaucrat in power. They were the people who laughed at those who are in the parliament and they said, well, they took the decisions. There were cabinet meetings and there was another cabinet, bureaucrats cabinet. They took the decisions, they sent it to the cabinet who would sign. This was the way establishment started to rule Pakistan. Legitimacy, for that they wanted the signatures of the prime minister who was the Ali Khan. The real decision was that of Secretary General Dr. Muhammadri, who was called the real prime minister for four years. Here was the political, the middle class, because bureaucrats belong to predominantly middle class, and of course, Kadi Azam. He was the epitome of the middle class.
So here was the establishment which took over and they continued to postpone elections one after the other one and they took, then they changed the electorate. No more direct election, indirect election. The 1962 elections, we will not give the vote to the people. They should vote only for the BD members and then they should vote for assembly and whatever. So they distrusted the, the uh, masses like anything. All that changed in 1970. State simply didn't know where the masses lie, where did their uh, priorities lie, because they were cut off from them for 20 years. There were no direct uh, adult franchise based, party based elections for 23 years. So there was a kind of a revolution, 1970. The indigenous revolution came. Bengali nationalism, Sindhi nationalism, and in Punjab it was a class revolution. And the state was benumbed. What has happened? Because they never realized. They were fearing all this for 23 years. That is exactly what happened. And that's how from there, then threat establishment continues to, in a way, subsist and adjust with Bhutto. After Bhutto then, he took over. So establishment wanted to rule directly through martial laws. Unfortunately for it, politically, people are very much mobilized. There is the only uh, uh, game in the town, democracy. So they have to play politically. That's how the junta, the establishment holds elections in its own way, shapes it, makes it, satisfies people's ambition for vote, and that's how the two power centers go on. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Sam. I think we'll open it up for Q&A because we should invite some questions or comments. Uh, there were many concepts uh, that uh, Dr. Vaseem uh, articulated in his answers, you know, the idea of a traditional society versus a modern state, uh, the uh, way middle class uses ideology as an instrument, uh, the concept of establishmentarian democracy and the perennial conflict between the, these different institutions and power centers that we're also witnessing today as I try to insert. Like in, uh, before we take the question I, from Vaseem Saab, I just want to say you migrants ki baat ki, to, uh, I was reminded of John Elia's uh, famous line, Ali Gar ke Londo ki shararat. So, wo baad mein aake unhoon establish puri ban gaye. Ji, Vaseem Saab. Ji, I'm also Vaseem. So, uh, just a small statement and a question. Any solutions, sir, at this point? Very good. Today, you do it. Dr. Sir, my name is Deep and I'm going to ask you a question of the solution. My concern is the establishmentarian democracy that you have introduced as a liberal fascist institution in this country. You have introduced a good word. मेरा सवाल ये है क्योंकि हमारी जो establishment है उनको कल रात zebra crossing दुबई में कहीं दिखाया गया है social media पे तो जो नया system है जो हमारी मैं particularly फौजी establishment की बात कर रही हूँ जो नया setup है जैसे वसीम साहब ने सवाल किया है मेरा question exactly वही है कि how do you see the future of establishment democracy in this country नई जो फौज का set up है उसके साथ आपको कोई उम्मीद दिखाई देती है आप देखते हैं कि यहाँ कुछ बेहतरी आ सकती है thank you thank you very much is it okay I go ahead yeah first of all of course I have discussed about the issues relating to the present structure of power and therefore of the conflict but I haven't talked about 130 sources of conflict. So when you say what is the solution, obviously you have to uh, first take up uh, what are the problems. Mm. So this was the power structure that I sketched out. This is how uh, one elite uh, dominates the other elite and of course the masses at large. And this is how we are constantly in a state of conflict. But uh, there are 15 minutes left. 
क्योंकि हमारे यहाँ हमारी हिस्ट्री पढ़ते नहीं हैं जो नौजवान लोग या जो बच्चे लोग अगली जनरेशन हैं तो कभी कभी दिल करता है उनको ऐसे झंझोड़ झंझोड़ के बताओ कि हम कहाँ से गुजर के आए कोई झंझोड़ा के नहीं <laughs> <laughs> तो थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर डूइंग दिस मैं तो इसको बिल्कुल अपने ट्रेजर्ड पीसेज में समझती हूँ क्योंकि बड़ी क्लियरली आपने बताए डायनेमिक्स और सब कुछ एंड आई विश के अ लॉट ऑफ इंस्टीट्यूशनल एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशन वो टेक इट अप एज अ कोर्स बुक जी बहुत अच्छा आइडिया है uh, उस पर भी बात करते हैं लेकिन डॉक्टर साहब ये सोल्यूशन वाला जो मसला है ना जाहरी बात है कि आपने उसमें बहुत सी आपने एजुकेशन में भी बात की है आपने उसके ऊपर जो तालीमी निज़ाम है हमारा उसका जिक्र किया है आपने इदारों का वो किया है तो अल्टीमेटली कहीं ना कहीं तो हमें ये भी सोचना होगा कि ये जो पचहत्तर साल का एक मर्ज है इसकी कोई ना कोई तो दवा कम से कम तलाश तो करें बनने में शायद वक्त लगता है लेकिन कोई उसके इंग्रेडिएंट्स अज्जा जो हैं वो मिले ताकि उसको घोट के घोट के या पीस के कोई गोले कोई चूरन बनाया जाए वैसे जो चूरन बहुत बिकता है पाकिस्तान में लेकिन मेरे वाला चूरन कड़वा है जरा वी हैव बिन गोइंग वन वे बट वी नीड टू गो दैट वे we have taken a road which doesn't lead to what we want and there lies the problem we want to be as developed as the west we want to be as powerful as the west and we want to be political politically stable as the west but we are hard very far from stability economic stability political stability whatever is happening and there are 1000 dobara bolie close i'm sorry uh so i thought uh then i can you know we enumerate a few factors like that without going into detail uh, i have mentioned for example education system it destroys people's minds in pakistan how it does uh I've taught, for example, abroad here and there, and my students. I remember, I remember my students here in Bams, and I can see the difference. Uh, the minds are dwarfed here. Zehni boni when I go to education, their expansion horizontally is stopped. That is. the next country and the next country and the next uh, culture and the next religion iran and india and afghanistan the world constrict the world they should know the world and then china and then the west and latin america and african side no dwarf horizontally world history is no way on our uh, curriculum and uh, comparative religion no way and thousand one other dynamics of education to expand the minds of the uh, students to to the globe along with whatever it means uh, by way of a variety of patterns of life no there is only one pattern of life and that is this and you must be committed to this this is the morality this is the idea and that is your life and this is your destiny and that's it so we have produced dwarfs in 70 years you don't let them have a world and apart from horizontally being limited they are vertically limited history forget it 100 years history 200 years ancient history going back to 2000 years 5000 years geological time no right and to school students in england for example the way i saw uh, the, the 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 museum in droves they would be taken to the natural history museum and they saw the uh, dinosaurs when were they 
and then the solar system, and they're constantly bewildered by the age which they are told about the uh, stars and about the solar system. These many billions of years, they, they say we are trying to grab and we are trying to understand these billions of years. Vertical growth? No. We don't know the history of 100 years before. We have obliterated the memory of all the, uh, the British rulers, and before that the Ranjit Singh, and before that the Mughals. Nothing remains. As if Pakistan has dropped out of the heavens like a bolt. That is what Pakistan is. You have cut the people from their surroundings uh, in every sense of the word, and you get, give them the doses of nationalism, morality, big, good behavior. Okay, go ahead. You will continue to suffer, and you are suffering. Media, control over media under every government, Iran's government, and uh, PDM's government, and before, a youth government, and whatever. Don't let them think freely. Control their mind. And then, of course, uh, the, the question again, how, what is the solution? Educationally, I can continue to talk. Media-wise, I can continue to talk. How to shape public mind. Uh, they, they make uh, war as sacred. Make peace as sacred. Not war. Go to England, go to France, go to other countries. They stopped talking about war as a sacred thing a uh, hundred years ago, after the Second World War. We are after peace, we are after war, and we have sanctified war. And we have to stop doing that. Don't go this way. We have 1,000 ways in which we are going that way. Actually, we have to go that way. So the whole direction of our thinking has to change, which means what? That there is a modernity crisis. There are modern countries of the world which dominate global civilization. We don't even want to learn how they dominate. We don't want to be modern like them. We don't even pursue that uh, path through which they came to this particular uh, position. We are introverted like hell and uh, we want we have chosen a certain way as if it would lead to some kind of modernity for example as i mentioned sometimes earlier with my friend as you can was sick of uh, this program he said i start this uh, population program family program and ulema pledged to me yes they'll be with me the, 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 the moment they go out, they start talking against me. So, during the last 70, 35 years, 20 years, I have seen those boards disappear. No, nothing. The, ideologically, you continue to be more and more religious. Policy-wise, you, you continue to go down and down. So now they are talking about third, uh, three, uh, two, two, uh, 22 uh, million, how many we are? 200, yeah, 200 million, and 200. then 300 million projected for uh, 1930, 2030, and then there is 50 crore for 50, 2050. How shall we feed them? No idea, because. God Gee, doctor, sir, we okay. have uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, Shahzeb, ye uh, Chicago se aaye hain, PhD student hain, aapko sunne ke liye. Or phir doctor Tariq Rahman, unki baat hum ye dono apke sawal lekar akhte ab ke jawab dete hain. Jee, Shahzeb. He has come there from. Ha, he has come very far. So, pehle Shahzeb ko chance. Jee, I'm also doing a PhD in political science. Sir. Oh, oh. Um, so, my question is that throughout your talk, you seem you began with this imagination of state as autonomous and above traditional society. And then as you kept going on, at times it seemed like the state functioned almost as a as a cl as class rule in a Marxist sense that, you know, the elite dominate the state and then it rules over us. So it seems that there's a shifting conception of the state and society distinction as you're going through your analysis. I was just wondering if you could talk about that more. Okay, how are you imagining the state and how are you imagining society? shifting. Uh, Aapka analysis, uh, as you were going through your analysis, there was a shifting uh, notion of state and society was changing. 
ये भी और फिर डॉक्टर तारिक रहमान साहब का सवाल है और फिर हमारे ये बहुत सारे यंग दोस्त बैठे इनकी तरफ जाएंगे जो आजकल की हमारी यूथ है जी डॉक्टर तारिक रहमान डॉक्टर तारिक रहमान भी यूथ है वैसे हमारे उर्दू में सवाल करूँ यानी लैंग्वेज जी बिल्कुल उर्दू कीजिए basically you have given the solution in both in the book and otherwise return of the native ma idea ye hai ke uh, the state you know we have to become the public also has to become more westernized more liberal humanist they have to pick up the same ideas unke jo apne ideas hain return of the native wali jo cheeze log kehte hain they going towards islamization or their culture etc Uh, that is the one which brings this perpetual conflict into play lehaza yes peace with india yeah. and westernization unke unke se ye conflict kam ho jayega jo aap education ki baat hai wo bhi hai education uh, uh, in the real sense that means liberal humanist education to so ye uh, ah. sawal kya hai tarjuma hai aapki kitab ka ji dono ko discuss kijiye state aur society क्लासेस Uh, pertains uh, that that applies uh, to these states where uh, states are relatively autonomous vis-a-vis uh, all the state all the classes uh, particularly in the third world countries so ahmed uh, alabi in a way and others they have been writing about it uh, and i have critiqued it in one sense that they talk about the state as a controlling mechanism they are the ones who who run the country i have followed the other uh, framework uh, where they say that the state is one of the social contenders for power so in the society out there state is one there are uh, private companies and there are the states companies private media and there is ptv there there the, there are the uh, public sector and there is the private sector there are there are all kinds of political actors operating there and there are opposition parties die hard leftist ethno regional parties and there are those the three mainstream parties they look towards the establishment please neutral na ho jana hame kuch do to wo they are there so they want to play the game of the establishment all three of them uh, and so on so mean they buy that the state of course is uh, the most uh, potentially most a uh, powerful contender for power but it's one of them there are others and including the uh, external elements including ngo in some say so they, this is this is the game they, 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 there are multiple players out there so that's why uh, let's not go for that clear cut state rules the society protects the bourgeoisie goes against the all area and so on uh, frankly i was talking mainly about look at the state which has been shaped by those philosophies institutions which were brought from abroad and they are in a dis- at a distinct distance from the society and they have been shaping it and their proteges are now shaping it and they have not been able to because they themselves are the product of the society and they believe for example in india they believe that thank hindu civilization doctor sahab thank you main chahta hu ki inko bhi zara mauya dekhiye bahut sare hath hai aap log do acha wo so piche jo baithe hain back benches ko pehle mauka milna chahiye aur fir aap idhar jo extreme left pe jo hai to aap extreme left my dogs wo hai udhar oh 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 jaldi se sawal puchiye अच्छा सर सबसे पहले ये है कि मुझे हमेशा ये मिडिल क्लास को समझने में मुश्किल है एक मेरा जैसा जो कि बहुत 
چھوٹی صوبی سے تعلق رکھتا ہو اور جہاں نہ پانی ہو نہ کچھ ہو اور ایک یہ لوگ اس حال میں بہت سارے لوگ وہ بھی میرے لیے ایلیٹ ہے آپ دونوں بھی میرے لیے ایلیٹ ہیں تو موسٹ آف دیٹ تو تو میرا یہ ہے کہ یہ جو یا جو ہم مڈل کلاس کی بات کرتے ہیں جو اربن سینٹر میں گیٹڈ کمیونٹیز میں رہتے ہیں وہ الیٹ کلاس میں پڑھ کے دیر سیکنڈ لیگ از ان یورپ وہ باہر جاتے ہیں ایک میرا جیسا بندہ جو کہ ہمیشہ ہی اس ملک میں رہے گا اور اس ملک میں اس ملک کے جو ایکچوئل کے پرابلمز ہے اس کو سمجھتا ہے میں کہتا ہوں اس کو آگے آنا چاہیے مڈل کلاس وہی ہے اور وہ نمبر میں بھی زیادہ ہے اور یہ جو اور یہ میرا یہ کویشچن ہے میرا یہ کویشچن ابھی آتا ہے کہ یہ جو لوگ ہے جو کہ زیادہ نمبر میں ہے اور ایک چگل یا میں اس کو کہوں گا لوور میڈل کلاس یہ آگے ایس کیسے آئیں گے اور لیجسلیٹ کریں گے ان لوگوں کے لیے جو کہ ادھر رہنا ہے اور ان لوگوں کے لیے لیجسلیٹ کریں گے اور رول لا بنائیں گے تھینک یو سر آئی ہیو مائی نیم از محمد عارف مائی نیم از جی سر مائی نیم از محمد عارف اینڈ آئی کم فرام ٹرائبل ایریا ڈسٹرکٹ کرم میرا سوال ہے سوال بڑا سمپل سا ہے سر آپ نے اپنی کتاب میں جو جو ٹرم انٹروڈیوس کروایا ہے اسٹیبلشمنٹیرین ڈیموکریسی ہم اس کو فوجیٹیرین ڈیموکریسی کیوں نہیں کہتے فوجیٹیرین ڈیموکریسی اسٹیبلشمنٹیرین ڈیموکریسی ٹرم آپ نے انٹروڈیوس کروایا ہے ہم اس کو فوجیٹیرین ڈیموکریسی کیوں نہیں کہتے انڈائریکٹ ہماری اپروچ نہیں ہے ڈائریکٹ ایک انسٹیٹیوشن انوالو ہے اس کے فٹ پرنٹس ہیں پوری ہماری جو سیونٹی فائیو ایئر ہسٹری ہے السلام علیکم جی اچھا پروفیشنلی تو میں ایک انجینئر ہوں لیکن جو میرا کوشچن ہے سر سے کہ یہ ہمارا جو امیچیور پولیٹیکل سسٹم ہے آپ مطلب اس کیا سمجھتے ہیں کہ ہمارا پولیٹیکل سسٹم امیچیور ہے جس کی وجہ سے بار بار ملٹری انٹروینشن ہوتی ہے یا یہ ملٹری انٹروینشن ہے جو ہمارے پولیٹیکل سسٹم کو میچیور نہیں ہونے دیتی اور دوسرا یہ آپ روڈ میپ کیا سجیسٹ کرتے ہیں اور اسپیسیفکلی ان یہ جس طرح اسمال ٹاؤنز یا ریموٹ ایریاز جو جہاں سے سیونٹی پرسینٹ ہماری جو الیکٹیبلز ہیں جہاں سے بلانگ کرتے ہیں تو ان کے لیے کیا روڈ میپ سجیسٹ کرتے ہیں کیونکہ یہاں کی یوتھ جو ہے وہ تو ایک ایجوکیشنلی اپنے آپ کو مائنڈ سیٹ اپنا امپروو کر لے گی اور وہ جو ہے اس طرح کی ڈسکشن ہوں اس میں پارٹیسپیٹ کرتے ہیں لیکن وہ لوگ جن کا اس طرح کے جو ہے ایک گیدرنگس میں آنا جانا نہیں ہوتا اور وہ مین گراس روٹ لیول پہ جو پرابلمس ہیں وہ فیس کر رہی ہیں ان کو ہم کس طرح ایجوکیٹ کر سکتے ہیں جو اکثر جو ہے پارلیمنٹ میں جی پہلا تو جی پہلا تو جی وہ انہوں نے جو کہا کہ ہمارے دوست کا سوال تھا کہ لوگ آپ نے جو مڈل کلاس کو آپ نے جو ڈیفائن کیا وہ اس کی کنسیپچول وہ کہہ رہے ہیں کہ لوور مڈل کلاس ہے مڈل کلاس ہے کیونکہ وہ کہہ رہے ہیں ان کے لیے تو جو پنجاب کی مڈل کلاس ہے ایک چھوٹے صوبے والے کے لیے وہ تو الیٹ ہے ایک تو انٹرا پروونشل یہی بات ہے نا آپ کی تو اور وہ کہہ رہے ہیں کہ وہ کس طرح سے لیجسلیٹ کر سکتے ہیں مختلف طبقات کے لیے انہوں نے کہا کہ جی آپ نے اسٹیبلشمنٹیرین کیوں نہیں کہا آپ نے فوجیٹیرین کیوں نہیں کہا اور انہوں نے کہا کہ جی کس طرح سے پولیٹیکل سسٹم میں آرمی کی انٹروینشن جو ہے وہ مچیور نہیں ہونے دیتی یا امیچورٹی کی وجہ سے آتی ہے امیچورٹی کی وجہ سے آرمی آتی ہے آرمی فردر امیچور کر کے جاتی ہے آپ کے دونوں سوال جو تھے ان کے دونوں رجحان ایک ہی جی مڈل کلاس جو ہے اس کے پاس کوئی دس شیڈس ہے ایک کراچی لاہور اسلام آباد کی مڈل کلاس ہے جو زیادہ کاسوپولیٹن ہے اور جن کا ایکسیس ہے ایلیٹ اسکولس انگلش میڈیم اسکولس ان کی ایک پروڈکٹ ہے یونیورسٹیاں ہیں جو چار پانچ پرائیویٹ یونیورسٹیاں ہیں انکلوڈنگ مائی یونیورسٹی یہ ساری ایک کیٹیگری میں ہیں یہ جو پروڈیوس کرتے ہیں بچے وہ پھر ساری جابس وہ گریپ کر جاتے ہیں تو یہ حیرات کی ہے ایجوکیشن کی اسی حساب سے ایجوکیشن انسٹیٹیوشن کی اسی حساب سے کیا کیا ان کا ایکسپوجر ہے باہر کی دنیا کا جو اور وہ یہ ایک وشیہ سرکل ہے ان انسٹیٹیوشن تک پہنچنے کے لیے آپ کو ان یونیورسٹیوں تک پہنچنے کے لیے آپ کو ایلیٹ اسکولوں سے آنا پڑے گا تاکہ وہ کمپلیٹ کر سکیں ان ان اسکولوں میں جانے کے لیے آپ کے پاس فیس ہونی چاہیے کہ آپ ان اسکولوں ان کالجوں اور ان یونیورسٹیوں میں جا سکیں اس کا مطلب ہے کہ وہ ایک سرٹن کلاس ہے جو ان میں آپریٹ کرتی ہے وہ کلاس ہی اس کو کہیں کہ یہ اس کلاس کا ایک نظام ہے آپ کو ڈومینیٹ کرنے کا وہ چل رہا ہے اس لیے آپ کہہ رہے ہیں کہ کیسے کریں جو ڈومینیٹ کر رہے ہیں ان سے تو آپ پوچھ رہے ہیں بھائی کیسے ہم آئیں گے اوپر وہ تو نہیں آپ کو آنے دیں گے وہ تو یہ تو سٹیزن جو ہے وہ تو اپنی اسٹرگل خود کر رہا ہے تو انگلینڈ میں امریکہ میں دوسروں ملکوں میں دے کیم اپ 
they struggled for hamare yahan forces they struggled these uh, poorer masses lower middle class others they are nowhere and they are not mobilized along the real issues that's why your your textbooks teach you morality religion anti indianism anti americanism wo issues jinka hamari political politics आपको वहीं रोकने के लिए यहाँ आप हैं अच्छा जी उनका भी वो बता दें कि आपने उसको क्यों इस्टेब्लिशमेंटेरियनिशमेंट इज अ वेरी कॉम्प्रीहेंसिव वर्ड द पॉइंट इज दैट ऑल द एग्स यू शुड नॉट पुट इन वन बास्केट आर्मी सब कुछ नहीं है यहाँ पे देर इज अ वर्ड जूज हैजनी मिलिट्री हैजनी है नहीं है अब बहुत क्वेश्चन हो रहा है बिकॉज कैन इट रूल बाई इट it cannot because there are certain people classes groups which are looking for our number one on top the middle class 90% of the educated middle class likes the military rule wants the military rule the most educated people of this country they feel safe from the fear of the rising masses these and business lobbies unpredictable politicians can go they these rebel rousers they can mobilize the people so you have to be careful uh, against these illiterate masses this let's see जी अभी आखिरी बहुत सारे हैं बहुत सारे सवाल आते हैं इसी सेशन के बाद आप बाहर मिल लेते हैं ना क्योंकि मुंतजमीन जो है ना वो डंडा लेके खड़े हुए वो कहते हैं बंद करें स्टॉप 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 अच्छा मैं ये इनका मैं पॉइंट जरूर कहना चाहता हूँ कि देखिए इस्टेब्लिशमेंट में डॉक्टर साहब आपकी इजाजत से इस्टेब्लिशमेंट जो होती है वो जैसे उन्होंने पहले कहा किताब में उन्होंने लिखा भी कि दुनिया में हर जगह वो पाई जाती है उसकी गायत फ़र्क होती है पाकिस्तान में मिलिट्री डोमिनेंट है उसमें लेकिन ब्यूरोसी को ना भूली है सिविल ब्यूरोसी अस खुद जो पटवारी नीचे पटवारी से लेकर ऊपर सेक्रेटरी तक वो एक परमानेंट इस्टेब्लिशमेंट है पाकिस्तान की और उसका फौज से नहीं ताल्लुक अब तो उसमें लैंड माफिया जो है पाकिस्तान का वो सबसे बड़ा इस्टेब्लिशमेंट बन गया है मलिक रियाज साहब आप देख लीजिए ना मसलन एग्जांपल या मीडिया हाउसेस जो है तो क्या मीस शिकिल रमान इस्टेब्लिशमेंट नहीं वो फौजी तो नहीं है ना कोई स्टार सो ही लगे हुए तो ये अब सारा एक ग्रुप बन गया है ये भी पाकिस्तान में इसकी राइज हुई है डॉक्टर साहब की इजाज़त से थैंक यू